Hi. Who's had a profound influence on your life? You know, I've had a number of people who have bounced into my life and bounced out who have had uh, influence and they've inspired me and they've motivated me to do things. I've had people who have been long-term people in my life, but I've also had a lot of people that are just kind of casual and incidental that have popped in and said things or done things or shown me things that really have impacted me in a positive way as well as kind of giving me some cautions along the way too. But I just want to encourage you as we are into week four of our Inspire Change series that you are an influencer. Now, you may not have a huge following on social media, but you have influence with people that are all around you and that you can and you are inspiring others either in a positive way or a negative way, but we believe that you're doing it in a positive way. And we think that you should be engaged in that and even more aware of that as well. You know, we all have different spheres of influence. Think about that model of the concentric circles where you have one circle surrounded by another circle, surrounded by other circles, and that air circle is you. You have influence in your life. You're the one who calls the shots, and you're the ones who's going to make a difference in your life and so what you decide and what you allow God to do in your life what you allow Jesus to do in your life is kind of up to you and then the circle around you is your family you have influence in your family you what you do impacts and affects them um, and you can inspire them to uh, change for the better and and put into practice some good habits and then around your family you have your friends that's the next circle around you and you, again, have this opportunity to influence and to inspire and then around those people or whoever else you kind of bump into. And I want you to think about this. A lot of times we think about inspiring is all about, you know, heavy investing into time and effort and energy. But there's a lot of times where we influence people, again, just by bumping into them, just by a casual contact, just by being there or just being that person that we look forward to seeing in the next moment. And so I want you to think about how that your influence is is beneficial and is really maybe larger than what you give yourself credit for. And I think that God uses us all in, in tremendous ways. You know, I believe that God's intent and God's purpose has always been to work in us, obviously. I mean, God's got to work in us. He wants to work in us, but then God works through us as well, using us in spite of or despite our imperfections and weaknesses, because we all have imperfections and weaknesses. Um, it's great when we have strengths, and we all have strengths, uh, and our strengths are, are great, and they're valuable, and they're appealing. It's what helps us get things done, and we love our strengths. It's what we're good at, but uh, we also have weaknesses, and a lot of times we disqualify our weaknesses. But I think God uses not only our strengths, but he also uses our weaknesses. And a lot of times we discount those weaknesses, but I don't think that, I think God uses our whole package. He uses all of who we are to have influence and to inspire others. And so I think our weaknesses have some tremendous uh, strengths to them, even though we don't like to look at them. Because one of the things that we, we do with our weaknesses is our weaknesses force us to um, become learners. We have to learn how to survive in spite of our weaknesses or to get around them. And so they cause us to adapt. They cause us to evolve, to change, to learn new things, to, to grow uh, because of our weaknesses. And so we have to find ways to maneuver around that and to make, it, make our lives work uh, in spite of our weaknesses. And so uh, we have greater compassion and greater appreciation for others because of the weaknesses that they have or the, the things that they're not as good at. So however we want to classify that. Let me give you an example. And I don't know if many people online know this, but I've been here recently in the last few years, been suffering from panic and anxiety attacks. And it typically happens when I'm preaching. Now, if you want to call that a spiritual attack, if it's a, if it's a, something that's physical, emotional, I, I'll, whatever the reason is, the reality is I have it. And I don't like it. And it is uh, terrifying and debilitating. 
So I, I, I'm challenged by that. And so uh, I've got some good people in my life who are speaking into my life and trying to bring some help and some relief as well. But what it has done for me is that by being just honest and open to people about the stuff I'm going through, I've had n numerous people come up to me and, and share, yeah, hey, I'm dealing with that too. And so my weakness has been hopefully an encouragement for others. And that number one, we don't have to be ashamed about it. It's just a reality and we're dealing with it, but that it's also something that we can grow through. And so I'm developing strategies on how to uh, make it work on my behalf or make or work with it in spite of it. And so it can be challenging and it can be also encouraging at the same time. You know, we have a greater sensitivity to people because of our weaknesses. And we can identify with people who are imperfect, maybe more so than we can identify with people who are perfect. Matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, the Apostle Paul talks about how that um, God allowed in Paul's life this tremendous weakness, this thorn in the flesh. And Paul says, I don't want it, but God says, you, you're, you're not getting rid of it. And so Paul basically says that in my weakness, I discover God's strength. God is strong in my life in spite of my weakness. And I want to encourage you along those lines that a lot of times in spite of our weakness, God can be tremendously powerful and strong. So hopefully you can be encouraged. So I want to encourage you to lean on God, but also lean on others. And one of the things I've really appreciated is my church community and my friends, people who come up to me and they say, I'm, we're praying for you. Is there anything I can do? How, what, a, what a tremendous tribute. What a, what a tremendous gift that they want to give in terms of I want to help you somehow, some way. What a wonderful group of people that we can uh, give to one another in that regard. So leverage what you have. And the things that we don't have, well, we'll just find a way to work around that in spite of that. You know, in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 through 10, it includes Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and then a, a series of stories of Jesus performing miracles of healing, acts of compassion, and acts of power, uh, and, and dealing with people and helping people. And then following that, that tremendous Sermon on the Mount, we see where Jesus is preparing his disciples uh, to, to go out and to do great works and to teach. He wants them to go out into the region of Israel, not beyond that because uh, that's later on. But he wants them to go out for a time and to speak into the lives of the people of Israel. So he, in essence, Jesus teaches his disciples and then he sends them. And in looking at this portion of the scripture of the Bible, it's important to remember a few things. The first one is this is that when you're reading the Bible, context matters. It matters what's going on in the story that you're reading. It matters in the story that precedes that. It matters in the story that follows that. And so context matters because it, we tend to look at one portion of Scripture and just grab it and go with it. But all of Matthew 5 through 10 is preparing us for what Jesus does with his disciples. And so uh, understand what the context is. And in that context, the episodes are put in an arrangement to showcase that Jesus has authority over demons, over, uh, over the, the world system, and that he gives that authority to his disciples to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And in this case, specifically, go into Israel and preach about the kingdom of God and do great things and then come back and report. And so he gives that authority that he's been declaring and showcasing in Matthew 5 through 10. And then he's telling his disciples, go and do likewise. And then one of the things we find out later on when he gives the great commission in Matthew 28 is that that authority is then given to succeeding generations of followers of Jesus. And so we are to walk in the authority of Christ as well. And so Matthew 5 through 10, again, is setting up this whole idea that Jesus has authority. He gives it to his disciples and he gives it to us as followers of Jesus. And I think that's important because God uses us not only in our strengths, but also in our weaknesses. 
And so in Matthew chapter 9, again, part of that whole passage and kind of setting this, this thing up, Jesus traveled through all the, time, the towns and villages, Matthew 9, 35 through 38. He traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of illness and disease. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them uh, because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his field. And so we have this idea that Jesus is aware that there are people that are hungry for God, but the uh, demand is so huge and there aren't enough workers. And a lot of times we as Christians here, especially in the U.S., we think, well, that's what the professional clergy are for. That's what ministers are for, and the, or that's what professional missionaries are for. But the reality is that we're all laborers in the field. We're all meant to be people who have influence and who inspire change in others. We are, we're all people who bump into other people, and God calls us to be involved in that. So let me just give a couple of things really quick. The first thing is this, that where Jesus and his disciples, wherever they went, they shared the good news. They were not shy about sharing about the kingdom of God, what God, that of God's love, God's grace, God's mercy. And we have to ask ourselves the question, do you think that God would ever use you? Well, the answer is yes, of course he would. Why wouldn't he? You know, you're smart, you're intelligent, you're, you're, you're capable. I mean, God created you for a purpose and this is part of that purpose. And so God would use you. And so the, the other question is, would you be open to being used by God in this way? And that's kind of really the key question. Because a lot of times it's like, well, yeah, I could do that if I wanted to. Well, do you want to? Would you be willing to be used by God in that way? And so that's part of the prayer. God, raise up a group of people who want to be used in somehow, some way. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to go to Bible college. You don't have to get graduate degrees. You don't have to do all that kind of stuff. You just have to say, yes, God, use me. I want to be used somehow, some way. And here's how you do it. You just talk to people about Jesus. Talk to people about faith. Talk to people about God. Talk to people about the beauty of the earth, about the weather. Just talk to people about who, who God is and how wonderful God is. Because the idea about the good news is that you want to give people the good news. I want people to know about God. I want people to know that God loves them and that God cares about them and that God uh, values them and God cherishes them and that God walks with them in the midst of challenges and time and pain. Uh, and it's not like I have to do this. I want to. I look forward to talking to my friends who don't know God yet, who who don't necessarily are, are in, in any part of a faith community, I want them to know that God loves them. If they come to my church, great. If they don't, great. I just want them to know about the goodness of God. I want them to know that God loves them, that God values them, that God forgives them, that God's mercy and grace is, is poured out upon them. I want them to know Jesus. And so I get to do these things. And so my hope and prayer is that you will want to do those things as well, because God has never disqualified you. God has always opened up the opportunity. Will you come and be part of the harvest? The second thing is that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion. The scriptures tell us that, that Christ understands what we feel. He understands the challenges and the temptations and the trials and the, the things that we're going through emotionally, spiritually, all those things. He understands and he saw them and he saw that they were confused and that they were helpless. You know, we live in an ignorant world that a lot of people don't know anything about God. Well, the only thing, the only way they're going to find out is if they watch us and hear us talk about who Jesus is. So share what you know and don't worry about what you don't know. If you don't know stuff, we'll help learn more stuff. And I'm learning all the time. So, I mean, it, it never ceases. You never get to a point where it's like, hey, I've got it all figured out. Nope. I'm still learning. Everybody else is learning as well. And Jesus said it's like sheep without a shepherd. So uh, there are a lot of people that just need guidance and direction. The third thing is this is that the harvest is great, but no one seems to want to work. Uh, and so the, the prayer is not, Lord, raise up laborers 
so I don't have to go. But the prayer is, Lord, raise up laborers to join with me. And that's our prayer uh, in terms of inspired change. We want you to join us and come and be a part of this adventure of following Jesus and experiencing God in our daily life, in our faith, and in the opportunities that are, that are yet to come. Uh, there is no end to the opportunities that are coming our way. And then the fourth thing is that God ask God to send out workers into the har harvest field. Now, a lot of times when uh, we talk about going to all the world and preach the gospel, for some people, the world is somewhere else. We have missionaries, strategic partners that go to other countries and other places uh, because God's called them. They, he's laid that desire and that, that heart upon them to go and work with specific people groups or different regions. But for most people, for most of us, we're here. This is our home. This is where we live. Wherever you're at, that's okay. That's where God wants you to be. And so your, your work, your home, your school, uh, your friends, your activities, your social media, that's, that's your world. And so that's the harvest field that God wants you to be working in. And don't run away from it. Why? Because you have influence. You're an influencer. You inspire others. And as you inspire people to grow closer to God because you are wanting to grow closer to God, that is inspirational. That is transformational. That is something that does an amazing thing in the hearts and lives of people. So let me give you a couple quick things and then we'll, we'll move on. The, the, the first thing is that get in the habit of praying for and with people. Don't run away from it. Pray for people. And it doesn't have to be long. You know, it doesn't have to be this big, long fancy prayer. If, you, if that fits the occasion, great. If not, that's fine. But, you know, if someone is hurting, you know, I'll just say, pray something like this. God, please help so-and-so. Um, they're just hurting right now, and you know everything that's going on, and God, just pray you be with them in Jesus' name. Something as quick and simple as that. I can pray that in an office. I can pray it in a hallway. I can pray it in a grocery store. I can pray it, you know, next to somebody's car. Just it's sincere, it's simple, and uh, Jesus said that you don't need to pray long, elaborate, stringy prayers um, uh, that are all embroidered. It, just simple, get to it, get it out. So pray for people and pray with people. Talk to them about, about God. Show them that God's alive in you. And if you're imperfect, great. Join the crowd. We've got, we got coats and everything that, that showcase that. And then invite people to... Uh, uh, talk to you anytime. Invite people to join you in coffee or at church or at an event. Uh, invite them to participate with you wherever you happen to be. You know, and I tell many times, I, I tell people many times, hey, if you need some, reach out to me. You can call, you can email, you can text. Um, you know, or if I just see them incidentally, you know, how you doing? And a lot of times people will just in the prelude, they'll just say, hey, you know, it's been kind of tough or whatever's going on. And OK, great. You know, how's the rest of the life? And then they we move on to the rest of the day. So it doesn't have to be spiritual. It can just be normal. And wouldn't it be great if our spiritual life was just part of normal life and normal living? And then finally, be a resource for people. Be a resource with people in terms of um, spiritual questions. Send people links or uh, information in terms of questions that they might have, or uh, you know, don't don't be sending all these cat videos or photos of food. I don't need those. Okay, but if you got some legitimate information that's beneficial or helpful for me, I'll take it. Would love to have that. All right. So those are a couple things that we hope that will be helpful for you as you as God uses you to inspire change, because God's desire is to use your life and use my life. Uh, in, with our strengths as well as in spite of our weaknesses. So anyway, I'm praying for you guys and praying that, that God would be at work in your heart and your life and that God would be at work in my life as well and appreciate the prayers. If you need to contact us, just reach out at info at snohomishfaith.com, info at snohomishfaith.com. And if you want to show up and see us, we're open every Sunday at 10 o'clock and hope to see you uh, sometime soon. Take care. Bye.